Hello, everybody, on a Quest Quick 30 pre show here on the Quest channel. I hope everybody's doing good. We have a fabulous guest on. I love when they come on. Once you see them on the show, and we don't get them on six or seven months later, we get them right on. And I really appreciate him joining us tonight. I want to thank all my Oak Island members, my paid members. My knights, my captains, my Senechels. I also want to thank Judy, who will be with us tomorrow night at 7.30, recapping tonight's show. And also Daniel, the Professor Spino, with all his hard work. I want to thank my moderators, Tammy, Judy, Michelle, Daniel, Starlene, and Kathy. And our Quest Lifetime contributor, Chris Dona. There will not be any uh, phone calls uh, tonight. We'll leave that for another night. But the number would be 1-323-813-4135. I want to welcome all my Facebook group members, which are my main source, my YouTube members, and also our Twitter live feed. I thank you all. And also our anchor host that hears us by audio, except for Spotify, which is a video side. I thank you so much for listening to that. There we go. Hello, Winston and Curtis and Gloria and Mike, Ashley. Can you hear me and see me? Fantastic. And then when our guest comes on, make sure you can tell me if you hear him and see him also. That would really help out as usual. I thank you guys so much for coming in tonight on a pre-show, The Quest of Oak Island. Some other things we'll go after, if we have time, after our guest appearance. It's called Yes We Can Tonight. The Fellowship races to complete their ambitious dig plan in the money pit as winter approaches. A Knights Templar lead has members of the team preparing for an expedition to Portugal. And I guess our main man, a friend of mine and a member, Corey and Maul, will have some kind of connections on there. We'll see tonight, guys. And it will be so good to see everybody. Hello, DD. Well, tonight we have a guest who you just saw last Tuesday and the Tuesday before that. He's a consulting underwater archaeologist at the History Channel for the Curse of Oak Island. I want you to please welcome, with a warm quest welcome, Dr. E. Lee Spence. Hello, Dr. Spence. Hello, John. Very nice to be on here. Appreciate being invited. You're very, very welcome. Very, very welcome. Well, this is it. This is my crew. I'm going ahead and shutting off my phone so that that doesn't interrupt us. Yeah, that's what I had to do, too. Sometimes, who the heck knows what happens with call-ins and stuff like that, so I just turned it off. Ashley says, hi, Dr. Spence. Curtis. I heard it come. Can you still hear me, doctor? Oh, my lordy 40. Hello. Well, he just froze. Going to try to get it again. I don't know why he froze. Hold on, guys. He's going to have to reboot. But um, that's how it goes. 
we did a pre-show and everything was fine. The minute you go live, I don't know what happens. So let's introduce him one more time. My friend, Dr. E. Lee Spence. Uh, There you are. Again, John, I appreciate being invited on here, and I apologize about that. My phone is actually how I'm getting. That's acting as my hotspot, so I can't turn it off. Now we got it. Everything worked fine on pre-show, and I'm going, well, we're only a minute into the live show, and we froze already. (laughs) (laughs) That was my fault. Sorry about that. No problem at all. No problem. We just go with the flow, Dr. Lee. I mean, Dr. Spence. All right, Lee. John, yeah. Let me see here. Go back to comments here. Curtis Bennett, thank you for discovering the Huntley off our coast down here in South Carolina, Curtis said. uh, Lee? Well, thank you, uh, Curtis. The Huntley was the first submarine in history to sink an enemy ship. Uh, That's in the entire world. And some people have asked me before, why do I say to sink an enemy ship? What other type ship would they sink? Yeah. (laughs) Good question. But uh, in the experimental stage of submarines, they sank a number of ships, but uh, the Hunley was the first one to do it in action to sink an enemy one. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Jeff M., one of my good supporters. Hello, Jeffrey. But um, yeah, usually when I get a guest on for the first time, uh, Lee, I always ask him this first question. Maybe it's two questions. Number one, out of all the people in the United States, how did the the Oak Island people uh, contact you? And how was it when you went to Oak Island? How did they uh, get you into the production part of it uh, to use your expertise? Uh, Thank you, Lee. Well, I'm not sure uh, how they decided to contact me, who suggested me or whatever, but... Mm -hmm. I've been finding shipwrecks since I was 12 years old, and I'm a little bit older than that now. So I've got a long track record, and I assume it was from that. Okay. Uh, as far as how did they treat me, they could not have treated me nicer. I mean, it made me feel so good. Uh, everybody I met up there was extremely nice. Uh, made me want to work with each one of them at some point in the future. Sounds fantastic. Like I told you before, a lot of people that do come on the show relate the same positive vibes they give to people up there. Yeah, They're very, very nice people and very professional. Uh, Were you ever on, I guess you were on uh, researching documentaries, but were you ever on like a TV show like this, sir? Yeah. Yeah, I've been on several of them. I don't really recollect their names right now, but I've been on a few others. And I'm actually also in a few novels and quite a few books by other people. Probably are. You probably are. Um, Also, how was my friend Tony Sampson, your your fellow diver up there? How was our friend Tony Sampson? He's always in my group. Maybe he'll show up tonight to say hello. I'm not sure because he's busy getting his boats ready for his boat tours, Lee. Well... I loved him. He's a really great guy. And earlier I mentioned to you that uh, we did go out and have a couple of beers together and swapped uh, diving stories. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Later on in this uh, gust appearance, I want you to talk about some of the stuff that you found and, you know, actual gold in your hand and artifacts in your hand. I'm so interested in that stuff. It's unbelievable. All ready? Yeah. We got one here. This is from Kathy. What shipwrecks have you found off of Oak Island? The Montauk Point. Uh, I have found shipwrecks off Long Island, but I'm not going to discuss them. Because <laughs> I may want to go back to one of them one day, or one or two of them, or three of them. Uh, I like Long Island. Okay, thank you, Kathy. No problem, Scott. Now, do you have a big research vessel, or do you lease a vessel when you go on a research, or how does that work, Lee? Uh, 
well, I've owned large research vessels, you know, 150 footers and all, but most of the work is done out of small boats mm -hmm. because most shipwrecks run aground. So they're fairly close to shore and fairly shallow water. And it just makes more sense to use a small vessel. And this is Jim Wilson. Dr. Lee Spence is an amazing man. His discoveries have made many contributions to our country's historical record. This is from Jim Wilson from Facebook. Well, that's real nice to have you to say, but I'm wondering who paid you to say it. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, your work is obviously top-notch research, so people recognize that. They recognize good work. All righty. Let's go through a couple of, uh, well, before we go through a couple of pictures from Oak Island, uh, the members wanted to know, even though you said it for a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes, uh, the wood artifacts that they found in the swamp when they put them on the table on the war room, Lee, you remember that? Yes. What can you say as far as anything else that wasn't, that wasn't televised, but we get such a short snip, snippet of what you say, and the researchers like you like to say more, but they only give you so much TV time. So can you give us any more uh, insight on those pieces that were on the table, or what can you say about that, Lee? Thank you very much. If you had a specific piece, I might be able to answer you, but uh, other than that, no. One looked like a paddle. One looked like a fan paddle. A what? A uh, look, look like a uh, ceiling fan paddle. Look like a paddle, a long paddle. Oh, uh, I think what you're talking about is something that uh, what we thought it might have been was a paddle. Yeah, you know, yeah. A paddle. Uh, and that could be from any time period. And I don't know if they had already dated the wood or if they were going to in the future to try to see how old it was. Yet, yeah, uh, where they usually date these wood pieces or carbon 14, whatever you want to call it, it was been closed up because of COVID. That's why we haven't got any latest uh, dates on any kind of wood, even from where they're digging the caissons and even from the swamp and the pieces you've seen. We haven't gotten any dates yet, so we don't we don't know, you know. All right, let me put some pictures up. All righty. And if you got questions uh, for Dr. Spence or Lee, just put them up, guys, and uh, we'll put them right up. He can see them. So these are the screenshots when you went dive in with uh, Tony Sampson, Lee. Yeah. Another one. And obviously, how do you get a permit, right, Lee, if you can't show any object and if it's buried into the silt, how the heck are they supposed to get a permit if nothing's shown? I mean, you can't prove to them there's something there except for the uh, the magmeter, but uh, what do you think of that, Lee? Well, they should be able to grant one on the basis of magnetometer readings. Okay. I'm not familiar with what their requirements up are up there, but that would be good enough for a court of law. Okay, but I'm not sure. Sometimes they get permits, uh, Lee, that they only can dig five feet, they only can dig ten feet, and then they got to show purpose within that five or ten feet to get another permit to even go deeper. You know what I mean? They want to sort of see proof in layers, I guess. Is is that the same with a treasure hunt? in the ocean uh, no really it isn't and most of the work that i've been doing in recent years uh i've moved outside the state three mile limit so i don't have to worry about the state and there's still some shallow water out there like one of the wrecks that i've been working off south carolina mm -hmm. that's at about oh maybe 15 16 feet of water at low tide mm -hmm. uh, it's three and a half miles offshore so going three miles offshore, it means what? Well, I'm just saying that being out that distance, the state has no say okay. in 
we don't have to get a permit from the state. Okay. And I filed an admiral claim out there and claimed the wreckage. Uh, there were no one challenged saying, hey, I own that wreck or I found that previously. And so uh, I need to get a share of it or something. But I've I filed a number of admiralty claims over the years. Okay. Here's a question from Tim. Dr. Spence, what is the most rewarding find you have made to date? Thanks, Tim. Really, it would be a wreck that I found when I was a teenager. And that was uh, the wreck of the Georgiana. Contemporary newspapers called her the most powerful Confederate cruiser ever built. and she was carrying a cargo worth a million dollars back in 1863. Uh, inflation has raised that number considerably, mm -hmm. yeah, about a hundred times. Uh, but I found that back when I was in high school and we raised cannon off of it, uh, bullets, cannonballs, belt buckles, ponchos, uh, dinner plates, you name it. It was just a thousand different things if I was naming them like that. Okay. But uh, some of them we found hundreds of thousands of examples of one item. I got this other Facebook user saying, Lee, what is the chance of discovering the name of a ship? If you do find one, if you do go back to Oak Island and they do have a permit, what's the odds of actually being a ship being named? It can be extremely difficult. Uh, it was years, it was probably 10 years after I found the Georgiana before I could get the local newspaper to agree that it was the Georgiana. Okay. And I tried to use some common sense logic with them saying, hey, this is the location history says it wrecked in, and history also says another ship wrecked on top of it. We've got a ship of the right type, sitting there and another wreck of the right type sitting on top of it. What are the odds of it being something else when nothing else around it is like that? And it still took me 10 years to get them to agree. Uh, and then it was only because one of the cannon we brought up was extremely rare mm -hmm. and was known to have been on the Georgiana. Okay. Here's one from Linda. Have you ever been off the Jersey Shore area and have you ever seen the 1800 train sunken off Jersey? No, I've not done any diving off Jersey. There's many, many shipwrecks out there yeah. that I've researched and would love to dive on. Some real treasure wrecks are off New Jersey. Okay, what is this piece you found and off of what shipwreck, Lee? Well, I'll tell you what it is, but I won't tell any details of exactly where it came from. Okay. Uh, but it's a sword handle that... Uh, belong to a series of pirate kings, at least that's what we believe. Mm -hmm. And it weighed uh, a little over a kilo, was 22 karat gold, and those are sapphires and rubies that you see on it. And it's oh. in the form of the uh, god Ganesh. Oh, my lordy. Now, who has this now? You? Unfortunately, I sold that. And so I no longer have it. Okay. Now, things like this here that you find, you either can keep it or give it to a museum or sell it, or what's the options to something like that when you find something like this, sir? Uh, well, it depends on the circumstances, uh, what your permit, the, you know, what the legal circumstances are around it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of, lots of different factors that factor in, uh, but... No, I have not had that in a number of years, but it's uh, it's a beautiful object. Somebody asked earlier what my favorite find was. Mm -hmm. Actually, my favorite find was that of a ceramic wig curler that for a man's wig, and I found it diving in the Ashley River near Old Fort Dorchester. Uh, but the reason I liked it so much, it was on one of my very first dives in that river, and it was total zero visibility. I couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And feeling around on the bottom, I felt this object. And even without seeing it, I knew exactly what it was. And it just made me feel real good you know, that I would know that, even though I'd never seen one in real life. I know, but 
how does it feel? Say if you're, I don't know what the depth you find these things at, all different depths. If you're down 20 feet, 30 feet, and you actually open up your eyes, not open up your eyes, but all of a sudden you do see gold coins, gold artifacts. What, go, what goes through your mind? I mean, do you give a big fist pump? Do you kick the dust up underneath the, <laughs> the ocean? Or what actually goes through your mind the minute you visually see something of value underneath the ocean? Something like this. Hold on, let me. Uh... <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a gold coin off a of shipwreck. Go ahead, show it again. I got you bigger here. Beautiful, beautiful. What just goes through your mind when you see that stuff? I can't imagine what I would do. I don't know. Um, well, actually, I probably get more excited when I'm doing my research than I do out in the ocean. Out in the ocean, there's so much going on that I have to worry about. You know, there are things out there that can, you can really get hurt badly out there. Right. Uh, but I know one time I was in the National Archives and I was back in the stacks, which is a restricted area. It's hard to get permits to go back there. Mm -hmm. But I did so much research. They preferred just letting me be back there by myself rather than pulling everything that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I came across some information that I've been looking for for years and suddenly I'm uh, jumping up and down and I'm yelling and <laughs> you don't think of that in the national archives, but that happens. It's like the guy, uh, the foot, football player that crosses the goal line and he's slamming the yeah. ball and jumping up and down. That was yep. me. Yep. I love it. I love it. Oh, and you said, what's it feel like? There was a wreck that I did get real excited over, and that was when I found the Hunley. I went swimming to the surface, screaming underwater that I found the Hun I found the Hunley. I found the Hunley. Yeah, you know, just uh, I know it seems strange thinking back on it, but yeah, that's all I could say over and over. I hear you. I would be doing the same. You know what I mean? Let me see what I got on the next slide here. All right, what's this from? Take your time. That's off the Georgiana. And that jar that I'm handing up, mm -hmm. that was filled with camphor originally. And there were packed four of those into a barrel. And they were packed in the bottom of the barrel. And then there were some uh, large bottles of some sort of medicine that were the next layer. And then some salve jars, ceramic salve jars were in the next layer. Uh, but we found a number of barrels of those. Very, very interesting. I just love this uh, stuff. Just, just a second. I'll yep. be right back. That's one. Oh, my lordy 40. Yeah. Isn't that a neat artifact? Yeah. It's big, isn't it? Oh, my God. And what year is that, maybe? Uh, the ship sank in 1863. 1863. Yeah. March 19th, 1863. Wow. Un unbelievable. Let's see, what do we got next? I don't have many on here. And this is when you were uh, Us diving like crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, that was the one day diving on the Georgiana. The man behind me there mm -hmm. uh, in the brown jacket, that was Wally Schaffer. And Wally, one day when I came to the surface, a shark was right behind me. And he reached over, over the side of a shrimp boat, grabbed me by my tank and yanked me out of the water. Oh, and my lordy, 40. And he he had a bad back after that. <laughs> but he was a really nice man. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. But that uh, that boat was a, a seventy two foot shrimp boat. Is what we were using. A shrimp boat, huh? Yeah. You got some question here. I think I saw. Where did you grow up? My father was in the military, so we lived all over the world. I was born in Germany. Okay. Uh, but we lived in Saigon when I was in second grade. 
Uh, we lived in the Philippines while my father was in the hospital from uh, doing a combat jump in, uh, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's years before we think of the war in Vietnam, but there was fighting going on there. It was, uh, I don't know, very different kind of experience. But I rode President Zim's pet elephant and saw beautiful things and saw horrible things. Right. Um, did they raise the Huntley, uh, Lee? Yes, they did Did raise it. Uh, and it's it's in a preservation lab right now. It's not really a museum, but it's sort of a quasi-museum right now because you can go in and see displays relating to it and all. One of the objects on the Hunley that was found, and this was part of the story of the Hunley, was that uh, the captain of it had been, uh, he had been in love with a young lady and she had given him a $20 gold piece. And while he was in a battle, uh, I forget, uh, I forget the name of the battle right now, but anyway, yeah. uh, it, he was uh, shot and the bullet hit his leg and the coin, which was in his pocket, took the brunt of the force and spread out. And according to legend, he carried that with him everywhere as a good luck piece. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that was actually found on the wreck when it was raised and excavated. They found the coin. Oh, my Lord. And on it, it says, my life preserver, uh, Battle of Shiloh, or else just Shiloh and the date. But that was the battle that he was wounded in. But that's what saved his leg and probably his life. Oh, my Lordy. Oh, my Lordy. Yeah. I got this one question, Lee. I don't know if you can answer it, but I'm going to put it up here. Daniel Spino, he's a great researcher in my group. Do you think a galleon could have gotten into and fit into the Oak Island swamp, in your opinion? Well, first of all, I don't think it was originally a swamp. I think it was a little inlet right there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the max depth of that inlet is. But, yes, I do think one could have. You know, they said it was a harbor at one time. I think so. What and remember, this is something I said to you privately earlier. Uh most ships run aground, and so many of them are in just three or four feet of water. Yeah. And, uh, the wrecks that the wreck I was talking about earlier that I said was in about 16 feet of water, that actually hit a sandbar that at low tide is just two feet of water. And right. then it washed, uh, the waves pushed it over that, and then it got inshore of that sandbar and ended up in what's now uh, about 14 to 16 feet at low tide. Okay, Lee, thank you. Okay. And there you are, the main man for tonight with the hat. Everybody likes your hat. Yeah. <laughs> that's your that's your MO. That's your MO. Yeah, when I uh, went to the award ceremony for uh, I'd won an, an award mm -hmm. and it was a formal dinner and yeah, with tuxedo and all, oh, I wore my hat anyway. <laughs> do what you got to do. Yeah. Now this guy, I've been watching his Florida shipwreck, gold coin, necklaces, shipwrecks. What can you tell us about Mel Fisher? Lee? I think he was a very fine man. I, uh, I first met him when I was 17 years old. I hitchhiked from Charleston to Miami to meet him and Bob Marks and another man that I heard were going to be down there. And uh, he was just a, a very fine person. And he loaned me equipment. He, he was real generous with his time and uh, advice and all. Uh, I actually had found shipwrecks in 1959 when I was 12. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, by the time this picture is taken, I'm quite a bit older. Uh, but no, I knew him most of my life. And just, uh, he was a dreamer. He wasn't a scientist. He was a dreamer. But he was a very hard worker and a very good man. And 
I think his discovery should be respected. I think that the state screwed him. I don't think they should be getting a share of the treasure mm -hmm. that comes off that wreck. Uh, they changed their laws and all so they could take uh, take a share off it. And I think that's just wrong. Yeah, that's what they do. You know what I mean? It's... Yeah. Uh, we got something from BC here. Oh, what's, you know. Let me see. Daniel says, what are your thoughts on Oak Island Triangle and the Bermuda Triangle and any other such phenomenon? Like they say, the compasses don't work or the GPS doesn't work. What do you think of that kind of stuff, uh, Lee? Well, I've never looked into the Oak Island Triangle. I, so I don't know anything about that. I can't really comment on it. I do know that there are ge uh, geological things that will cause compasses not to work in certain areas or to to cause them to deviate from normal. And I've had my own compasses uh, not work properly when I've been offshore in storms or, or whatever. Uh, as far as the Bermuda Triangle, mm -hmm. a lot of the legendary things that have happened didn't even happen in the area they call the Bermuda Triangle. And uh, depending on who's defining that triangle, it's vastly different, includes vastly different areas uh and a lot of the stuff that they say is mysterious it's only mysterious because they didn't have modern equipment if they had modern equipment those those same mysteries probably would not be mysteries yeah they're talking on the oak island triangles between oak island and frog island right where you guys were diving because like maddie's equipment went crazy and things don't work right and cameras don't work but uh, that's for another time, I guess. And BC says, in your opinion, what do you think took place on Oak Island? Well, my opinion is, uh, my personal opinion, right. it has nothing to do with pirates. All right. Uh, then it comes down to two possibilities. Is there treasure there or is there not treasure there? Mm -hmm. Uh one possibility, the not treasure there possibility, is that somebody excavated, you know, the boys. Mm -hmm. They started looking, didn't find anything. And then when they gave up, someone else came and the story just grew and grew. Right. But there's also another uh, possibility, you know, that being there is something there. And if there is, what would be worth all the effort that was put in? Who would have the engineering knowledge to do it? Who would have something that was valuable enough to hide, knowing that pretty much you could never retrieve it? Mm -hmm. And to me, that the only answer for that would be the Knights Templar. Uh -huh. so that's been my belief for years and years. I first heard of the uh, uh, Oak Island treasure uh, when I was a teenager. I don't know if the first time I heard of it was when that uh, famous article in Reader's Digest came out, or if I already knew about it by that point, I, I just don't remember. Okay. But I certainly read that article when it came out. Uh, but the Knights Templar thing, it does make sense. They had every bit of the ability they needed. Uh, they controlled a great deal. They were wealthy. They could keep a secret. Mm -hmm. All the ingredients you need. So, yes, it could be true. Tim says, where have you found most of your wrecks regionally? Is there one particular spot that, not spot, you don't have to tell the exact spot, but is there a regionally spot that you know? There's a bunch of them that you found? Well, the most wrecks I've ever found in one location, I found in about two hours' time, and that was 28 wrecks, and that was on a small island in the Bahamas, or just off a small island in the Bahamas. Uh, but I don't know... I don't really know where I found the most wrecks. Uh, I found around Charleston, there are over 1,500 wrecks. If you did a, a circle around, a five-mile radius circle around Fort Sumter, which is at the entrance to Charleston Harbor, mm -hmm. you'd take in at least 1,500 shipwrecks. Oh, uh, Lord. I, I know I found at least 100 of those. Did, uh, did there are a lot of wrecks out there to be found. People think that, oh, uh, people that got in it back when I did in the, in the late 50s and early 60s, they found all this stuff. No, we barely touched it. There are millions of shipwrecks out there. 
Uh, New Jersey has treasure wrecks. New York has treasure wrecks. Uh, yeah, they're all up and down our coast. Uh, there were some wrecks found on Padre Island. Well, whenever those wrecks were lost, the Spaniards, when they got the first reports back, all they knew was they were lost on the coast of Florida. Mm -hmm. Well, they've been found in Texas. How does that match? Well, the way it matches is Spanish Florida went from Virginia to Mexico. Mm -hmm. no, Spanish Florida. And so those sort of lost my point here. Sorry about that. But uh, the shipwrecks, whenever they were first reported to Spain, uh -huh. uh, the man they sent to look for him, the first location he went to was South Carolina, which was then part of Florida. And he okay. looked there and did not find them. And then he ended up all the way over on Texas, and he did, uh, did find them there and did recover some stuff. Did you say you found 28 wrecks in two hours? Yes. Oh, my lordy 40. Uh, Mary Beth Northcutt Walker says, I knew you when. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> hey, Mary Beth. She and I went to high school together. Okay. And Mary, Mary Beth, I don't know how well you really remember me. I know you're one of my sister's best friends. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I'm in the autism spectrum. And I didn't know it back then, and other people didn't know it. And I don't know if you ever experienced any of my meltdowns back then. Uh, but one of the reasons that I'm mentioning it is to apologize to you if you did. And even if you didn't, it's to tell people out there with family members who have autism that, hey, some of them, I don't really grow out of it, but I just learned to act normally. <laughs> and we can do a lot of other things. You're doing fine. Anyway. You're doing That's fine, nice Dr. Different. Spence. You're doing fine. Daniel, was there a time you were in a dangerous situation in your work? So many times I can't count. Oh, my I'm Lord. I'm serious about that. I have had wreckage collapse on me, iron wreckage collapse on me oh. when I've been on a wreck. I've been buried in the mud on an iron wreck. Yeah, underneath an iron wreck, actually. Uh, I've been lost inside a wreck. I've had my regulators fail on me at different times. I've had my air hose get caught in the uh, research vessel's propeller because we were using the prop wash to blow holes in the sand. Mm -hmm. uh, just countless things, and s some of them numerous times. You given out of air. Yeah. Yep. You definitely have all that sonar equipment, right? The sonar and the latest technology before you go dive in, uh, Dr. Spence? Well, obviously, when I was 12 years old, I didn't have it, and it didn't right. stop right. me from finding stuff. And so one reason I'm mentioning that is not say, hey, I was 12 years old and I found it. It's if Lee Spence mm -hmm. with autism can go and find shipwrecks when he's 12 years old, I guarantee most of your listeners right now uh, the people watching this could do the same thing. They just have to get out and do it. You don't have to have a magnetometer. You don't have to have a sonar. Uh, the mag that we acquired for our most recent project, it's $41,000. Oh uh, the, the sonar like what we're, we've got, it's another 40 grand or more. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need those to make discoveries. You need common sense and hard work more than anything else. Right. Not unless you're in the Antarctic, the Arctic, and they found the, the ship, uh, what was it called? Uh, under the ice, you know, three, two miles under the ice, that uh, one in 1911 that sunk up there in the Arctic. Yeah. I, for, I forgot the name of that, but. Endurance. The Endurance, yeah. And then Didi, a good friend of mine, a great artist. Does Dr. Spence have a book or plan the right one about his life? There you go, Dr. Spence. Well, I was saying to John earlier that I've been working on uh, doing a book, and unfortunately it's not going to be published anytime soon, uh, but I've been doing a book on shipwrecks of the Bahamas. And that book is now, this is a part of it, but done in this format, uh, it would be 34 volumes. 
uh, there's 12,576 footnotes in it right now, and I'm not finished. Yeah. And, this is Judy. But she's, as far she's as my... books that you can find of mine, you can go on eBay. Mm -hmm. I don't get any money from them because they're out of print. You'll be buying used copies, but mm -hmm. uh, you can go on eBay and Amazon, and you can usually find uh, at least one of my books, uh, Treasures of the Confederate Coast. Uh, it has a chapter on the real rep Butler and stuff in it, but I do plan to release some of my other books again to put them out. I've been looking into how to do that on Kindle and how to do that mm -hmm. just on print on demand books. Uh, but I've done about 30 books so far mm -hmm. and it just depends what happens to be being sold at the time, but they are there. Okay, this is Judy, my moderator. She's on with me tomorrow night. She does a synopsis of the show tonight. She says, you're a brave man. It's an honor to know you. Thank you, Judy. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Unbelievable. So, that's about it. I want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Spence, for coming in on and being with me on the pre-show. Um, very knowledgeable, very intelligent, very, very interesting. I really appreciate you coming on. And let's see, Daniel has one more question. Have you dove on wrecks around Nova Scotia before? If so, what are the dates and country of origin of the ships found if you dove up in Nova Scotia? No, I, I haven't. I've been to Nova Scotia quite a few times, but it was to buy... Uh, government vessels up there to use as research vessels. Um, I don't have a YouTube channel right now that's really showing anything, but I do plan to start one soon. And also people can go to my website, which is shipwrecks.com. And there's a lot of information about shipwrecks on, on that site. You know, it's shipwrecks.com. Right. When this uh, live show is over, I'll post any links you want me to post so people, when they're watching the show, again, your links will be below us so they always can be known and knowledgeable of what you do in your other, not podcast, but your uh, web page so they know and learn more about you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I really appreciate being invited on here, and it's I've enjoyed it. Yep. Well, you got to come on again now. And just, you know, get some more pictures of all these uh, treasures, actually treasure in hand. I mean, we've been on Oak Island for nine years. And we're finding some surface finds. What's I put that the, now? These are some uh, rings off a wreck, I believe, of the pirate ship. Uh, but they're they're just gold gold rings from the late 1600s. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, again, uh, if you want to button it up, uh, Lee, and say your goodbyes to my members and then stay in the staging area because I'm going to just say a couple of things and then I'll meet you in the staging area. All right. Take care, Lee. You too. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. I'll see you in about three, four minutes. Okay. Bye-bye. What do you think of that, guys? Unbelievable. Unreal. I thank him so much for coming on. A great guest. Just fantastic. Very, very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Here's some things that they're going to show tonight. This metal piece that they find in a case on. There's the case on DM2 for tonight. Keep your eyes out. We'll see you, me, and Judy. Tomorrow night at 7.30 for the synopsis and the recap of tonight's show. But I don't know what we're going to find tonight. This piece, I have no idea what they're finding. And this other piece, it said it's a cement piece on a piece of board, maybe part of the vault. So keep your eyes open. And we got Corey in on about this connection with the Templars in Portugal. So keep your eyes open. And there's Corian. He's been on the show many times, a friend of mine. 
And it's just fantastic, guys. It's just fantastic. So watch tonight's show. And we'll see you tomorrow night at 730. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. But members, remember, always go forward. You may get a setback, but just believe in yourself. Believe in your dreams, no matter how old you are. You keep smiling. You be kind. For tomorrow's a never given with this crazy world that we're living in. So stay strong. Stay positive. Stay safe, guys. Thank you for joining me and Lee tonight. We'll see you tomorrow night with Judy at 730. I hope you enjoyed the show. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Take care. And bye-bye.